Hey everybody, uh, my name is James Ikeda, and uh, this is mctheprofessor.gov, and we're going to do a, a little lecture for you. So uh, uh, get a grilled cheese, have yourself a coffee or a beer, and, uh, and enjoy. And if you hate it, it doesn't last forever. Uh, anyway, take it away, band. This lecture is called Testimony as Activism. And so let's begin with definitions just so we're all on the same page. Activism is a word that a lot of people use, but it's not uh, always understood exactly what we mean by this word. So let's just get a definition, working definition. Activism, broadly speaking, are actions undertaken to bring about social or political change. And the thing about activism is that generally, when we use the word, we're talking about very specific kinds of action. Namely, we think about marches, we think about occupations, sit-ins, we think about boycotts, direct assistance, consciousness raising activities, electoral campaigning, canvassing, all these different kind of things we tend to think of as activism, this kind of stuff. Right? Testimony is not a word we usually associate with activism. Right? This would be like the communication of first-hand knowledge. You think about this in like a legal setting, right? Like you uh, give testimony in court. Um, but also testifying could more generally just mean you're sort of saying something about something. Like this person is, is a poet, right? Today I'd like to argue that these two things are, if not synonymous, very closely related, conceptually. So let's first talk about what impact testimony actually has, right? I don't know if you know these people. I'm not sure if you've seen these people before. This is Reese Taylor. Reese Taylor. And uh, that's uh, Joan Little. Reese Taylor and Joan Little. I'm not sure who that is. I guess Joan Little's friend. Um, Reese Taylor and Joan Little are two black women from the United States, one from the, uh, who was in this picture of the 1940s, one picture from the 1970s. Um, and both women are famous for their testimony because uh, both women, albeit separated by several decades, were the victims of sexual violence at the hands of white men. And both women took these men to court and both women stood in front of the court and gave their testimony and explained what happened, right? And spoke the truth. In Reese Taylor's case, she did not get justice, 1944, Alabama. But by 1976, Joan Little was actually successful, right? And the story that connects the two is 30 years, right? 30 years of black women who experienced sexual violence at the hands of white men, uh, who, building upon the legacy of Reese Taylor, eventually built up power because they wouldn't stop testifying, because they continued to testify and speak the truth and called out these aggressors time and time and time and time again against a hopeless, biased system which would not listen to them, right? Um, and someone like Reese Taylor was able to get in front of a courtroom, right, an all white jury and plead her case. And despite the fact that it ended up, you know, she lost the case. Uh, that kind of bravery is not just 
some random action. This is a form of activism because for people who experience marginalization of any kind, testimony is a rebellion against erasure. Testimony is a rebellion against erasure. It is an affirmation that you exist and that you exist on your own terms. And whether or not people who are listening to you, or even if people aren't listening to you, whether or not people are receptive of that, testimony is a tool that allows people to exist on their own terms and to affirm that existence and to rebel against that erasure. But I think a lot of people have a difficult time seeing things this way and understanding testimony, sort of speaking your truth particularly in a legal setting, as being a form of activism. Um, so maybe we've got to back up and talk about the concepts that underpin this. Students of philosophy will be familiar with the term epistemology, right? Epistemology is the study of knowledge. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Those who study epistemology, the sort of students of epistemology, ask questions like, what is knowledge? Where does it come from? What form does knowledge take? How can you create knowledge? How can you take knowledge you've created and communicate it? I want to make an epistemic argument for you, and it is this. My assertion is that experience, meaning individual experience, right, is an epistemic space. Experience is an epistemic space, which is to say that experience is a knowledge generative process, right? So you take, for example, all the experiences of your life, all the things that you sort of deal with in your day to day and all this. If you take all that experience and you reflect upon it and you distill all the lessons from that, you can actually generate knowledge about the world. I can give you a simple example of this. When I was growing up as an Asian American person, I always got the question in elementary school if I was uh, uh, half Asian and, ha and half American. Uh, and I, I struggled with that, because as a five-year-old, I didn't know what nationality was. I didn't know how nationality and race and ethnicity differed. I didn't know any of that kind of stuff. What I did know is that something about that question made me feel kind of weird. And for a long time, I thought about it. I was like, why does that make me feel so weird? What's up with that? And then one day I realized, oh right, it's because like I, I am uh, an American person because that's my citizenship, that's my nationality, but I am uh, an Asian person and I'm Japanese uh, and I'm mixed race and all these other things. And it took a long time for me to realize that I kind of got to decide what that meant for me. But the interesting thing about it was that a five-year-old right, was experiencing something which I was not able to articulate and yet my experience upon reflection gave me knowledge about the experience of Asian American people in the United States. And I began to realize that there was this long history of Asian people being, for example, uh, treated as perpetual foreigners or as sort of perpetually outside of what is considered normative in the United States. And again, these are things that no five-year-old could possibly articulate, and yet I was experiencing things that were e evidence of this. And upon reflection, when I got older, I was able to figure this out. We actually generate knowledge about how the world works just by paying attention to and reflecting on our own experiences in the world. Just by paying attention, right? But there's a problem with this, right? Because there's a whole bunch of us, right? There's billions of us, which means there's all this knowledge that we are constantly generating about how the world works. But we don't necessarily have the tools to be able to put that together into something that makes sense even to us, right? And moreover, even if you can make your experience make sense to you, even if you can turn that into knowledge for you, the knowledge that we generate through experience is not necessarily accessible to other people. And as such, it's not taken seriously as real knowledge. Because you didn't read it in a book, or you don't have a study, or you don't have any kind of you know, scholarly backing. right? And the result of that is we have all this knowledge, all this information that we just ignore, all this learning that we just pretend isn't, isn't, isn't out there. And yet we have this massive source, untapped source, of rich knowledge about the world. 
and we've got to figure out how we can bridge this gap between that which is intelligible to you through your experience and that which you articulate for others. Now, I'm an educator by trade, right? Uh, and in the education field, there's this, uh, this word called constructivism, which is really relevant here. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with constructivism, but here's basically the idea. It used to be the case that people thought about teaching as like, I have knowledge, here it is, I have knowledge. It's a little thing, I, I did, people studied a thing and then they, they made knowledge. And then you take knowledge and you just give it to somebody, right? I say, hi, 17-year-old student, here it is, there's the knowledge. And they take it and then they have it. But that's not actually how it works. It's not that simple. Instead, what happens is, you kind of have a thought, like you, you, you even if you're reading a book, whatever, you're, you have this idea, right, about what the knowledge is. And then you actually have to translate that into an articulation that you speak, right? So I take the thing that's in here and I articulate it, which means I'm translating it from here into this thing, into the words that I have, into the language, which is limited, right? And which is sort of shaped by my conditioning. And then the other person, right, they then have to interpret my articulation of my thought, right? And then if I was to ask them, hey, explain that back to me, right, they can then articulate their interpretation of my articulation of my thought, right? And the question becomes, how similar are these two things, right? And very often they're not similar at all. They're often totally different because we're different people, different experiences, we have different brains, things come to us in different ways. And so a lot of the problem, if you think about things in a constructivist way, our problem is figuring out how to kind of close the gap between those two things. Take the things that are, are, are obvious knowledge to us and make them into something which we can give to other people and which they can articulate back to us. And that in mind, It brings us to the subject of the evening. It's a storytelling mic. Well, why do we tell stories? Thinking about my sort of little epistemology idea here. Stories are articulations of experience. And what they do is they take that individual experience and they make it intelligible to other people. It's a distillation of our experience and thus a distillation of our knowledge that we have generated through living. And we turn it into a story which we give to somebody else and then they get to learn, which is awesome, right? So you have sort of your life experience, which you reflect on, and out of that reflection, you generate new experiential knowledge, which you then tell through story, and then learning happens, which is amazing, right? It's so cool. And the best part about this is that everyone can do it, because everyone lives a life, and everyone has experience, and everyone is unique in that sense. And in that way, we all have knowledge that we can get from each other, right? We're just like these little books that no one wants to read ever. But through storytelling, we can make those stories available, and we can make that knowledge available, and we can teach. And moreover, if we go back to the sort of thinking about Reese Taylor, and you think about the relationship between storytelling and marginalization, I mean, we learn by listening to stories, right? Actively listening to stories is like learning. It's going to class, right? And when you listen to a story, it gives us special access to knowledge we are not able to generate ourselves, right? So I have all these students who are like 16, 17. If I listen to them, which no one wants to do because they're teenagers and nobody cares, but if you listen to a teenager actually like talk about their lives, they are giving you knowledge about the world that you don't have. You don't have any access to that, right? Because you're not a teen right now. Or maybe you are, I don't know any of you, but maybe, you know, I'm assuming. But if you're not a teenager living in 2018, and you talk to a teenager who does uh, live in 2018, what happens is you can actually take their experience, which they trans their knowledge, they translate into a story, you listen to them, you learn something, and then you know more about the world, and you can be more effective as a person, right? And the thing is that marginalized voices uh, rarely have a receptive audience. And marginalization, of course, crosses a lot of bounds, but if you think about this, like, you know, people of color and queer folks and women, poor people, undocumented people, right? 
very often don't have receptive audiences for the knowledge which they can share through storytelling. Right? And this is an incredibly potent tool. It's this massive, un untapped reservoir of learning, uh, which we, we ought to be diving into. And too often we choose not to listen, because we just don't think it's worthwhile. But what we're doing when we choose not to listen to somebody is we don't want to learn. We're opting not to learn. We're closing ourselves off to knowledge. So I, the, the takeaway here is that experience generates knowledge. It's, it, is, it is an epistemic process, right? Experience-based knowledge can be articulated through storytelling and then active listening, right? Actively listening to the stories others tell gives us special access to that knowledge which we cannot generate ourselves. And I would actually take it a step further. I started this by saying that I think the testimony is activism. I would actually say that all activism is in a sense testimony. And that might seem like a weird argument. But I want you to think about this. Inasmuch as activism's goal is to change society, what you do through any form of activism is you take the knowledge that people have through their lives, the knowledge, for example, about like structural injustices, and you make that so obvious that it can't be denied. I mean, think about what the mid-20th century black freedom movement really was. Anyone who was paying attention or who was living the marginalization could tell you that Jim Crow was a monstrous system, and yet it persisted. And what the black freedom movement did was it took all of the lived experience and all the knowledge generated from the experience of that oppression and made it into a movement, which was a blunt object which could be acted against society. And the result was people learned a lesson, right? And society evolved. It was, at the end of the day, an exercise in being made to listen. And the voices are all around us. Anyone who is trying to, you know, make a positive change in society is trying to make us listen to a voice that we're not listening to. At the end of the day, combating racism and white supremacy and misogyny and transmisogyny and ableism and all these things is just about the actualization of the experiences of marginalized people in the world. It's taking the truth of that experience and making it undeniable. And very often that begins with testimony. It begins with storytelling. And that in mind, while it's not true, of course, you know, not all stories are political in nature and not all stories feel like they follow this uh, sort of activist -y model, but I want you to be thinking about that. And as we begin the story, Mike, I want you to remember how important it is to listen and how important it is to actively listen and to glean the knowledge that other people have generated through their experience by listening to the stories they have to tell. We do birthday parties, we do all kinds of things. If you're trying to have a lecture at an event, let us know, because that would be weird. And that's fun that it's weird. Thanks for listening. <laughs>